It's yeah. also with the, with the Native Americans, you, know, you look at the Comanche, you look at any of them, it was the disease that, mm-hmm. you know, when, when from the first pilgrims, mm-hmm. all these things that, that Europeans brought over. And, I mean, it just decimated. I think cholera killed 60% of the Comanche. Yeah, they said that 90% of the people killed in North America were killed by diseases. Yeah. 90% of the Native Americans. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that story hasn't been told properly. You know, and that's what I, I really appreciated about 1883. It's like you you talked about, I mean, this was like the end of the Native American empire, essentially. This was when there was still a little bit of buffalo left. There's still, you know, they're moving Indians to reservations. Then the Indians that were out, they were resisting it, you know, and it's just, and then these people are trying to make their way in this fucking wagon train across the country. What, yeah. what percentage of those people died? That we're trying to do that. I mean, I don't know that there's any anywhere along the Oregon Trail. You could you can drive along, or you know, there's markers just everywhere, everywhere. And especially the further up you get into Wyoming, and the further you start getting through, like the Lander Cutoff uh, and South Pass, then they're just. And that's the ones that you know that got a marker. Yeah. So it's how do you know? Right. You know the handcart. Uh, the Mormon church brought a lot of people out and they didn't have a lot of money, enough money to give them uh, full wagons, even though that's what they promised. So they made these hand carts that people would pull from wherever they took off from, somewhere in Ohio, uh, to try and get to, to Utah. Um, and so these people pulled them by hand. They put their wife and their gear, their kids or whatever, and then they'd pull them, these two wheeled carts, like chariots <laughs> without a horse. And you know, one winter they left too late and got caught in the winter. And the whole trick was if you didn't make it to the certain spot in Wyoming by July 4th, you were not going to make it. You were going to get caught in the pass and you're going to die. And something like 25,000 people died in one year. <sighs> Just wow. mind numbing statistics. Insane. Yeah. Insane. And it's, it's so interesting that the, the early films on the West, they were, they never covered that. The early films in the West were like these really sort of shallow surface films that were fun movies, you know, cowboys versus Indians, the spaghetti westerns and that kind of stuff. But no one had any sort of real understanding of what actually went down. No, you didn't. The notion of getting free land uh, that you could go farm uh, with, by the way, nothing. You're going to go somewhere with nothing. Like, there's no stores. You're going to have to make everything. You have to figure it all out on your own. Who would choose that? Not a successful blacksmith. Not somebody that's got a nice, comfortable home in Maryland or wherever. And the, why, why? Why would you do that? You have to have no other option. Right. Right? All the people that came over from, from whatever European nation they came from, they didn't come for an adventure. Right. They came because they were fucking starving. My family came over from Ireland because of the potato famine. They didn't, they didn't want to. They had to. Right. They were dying. So they had to come. So that's why everyone came. Desperation. Like desperation is what settled the West. Fueled by a manifest destiny, which was which was a cruel, very cruel, you know, insidious idea that a bunch of politicians had that says, Hey, we can either send the army out there and just go to war and we've been doing that and we've been getting the shit handed to us because the Lakota were until the repeating rifle came around the Lakota and the Comanche, yeah. the Arapaho, even the I mean, they, we did not have their skill level on a horse. Their, their arrows were actually more effective than our single shot muskets. Like they were a superior army and, and stayed that way. It wasn't until we started sacking villages when the braves were gone, when their soldiers were gone, we, when that dirty shit started, then it started turning the tide, and then when we killed the food source, that was the end of it. Yeah, which is part of the wiping out of the buffalo. Yep. I mean, it was a commodity for sure, but it was also, there was a concerted effort to cut off their food source. It was, but it was also, you know, there was a demand. The buffalo tongue was the number one delicacy in New York City. Isn't that crazy? The and tongue. The tongue. Which nobody wants anymore. I don't know. <laughs> And then they sold all the they sold all the the buffalo skins to France, mm-hmm. and they made giant, massive, silly robes. Well, at one point in time, the richest man, one of the richest men in the world, was uh, he dealt in beaver pelts. Yeah, I don't doubt it. There was fucking beaver everywhere. They wiped out most of the beaver in this country. Yeah, 
You know, but they've come back. Yeah, they've come back, yeah. but not nearly to where they were. No, but they've come back. It's pretty. Imp- I mean, it's pretty impressive how much they've come back, and it's a pretty keystone species. So wherever they are, you know, they build enough dams and they create a pond. It creates a wetland. Have you ever eaten beaver? No, it's good. That's what I hear. Steve Renell was a it. was a a delicacy. Yeah, the tail the tail's disgusting. We ate the tail. It's just all fat. They just were starving and they needed <laughs> fat. We maybe we didn't cook it right, but Ranella cooked it as best he could. But we he made like a pot roast out of the beaver hams. Yeah, it was very good. Really? It was like really good beef. It was really? delicious. It was surprisingly good. Like not like oh I could eat this, but like I want more. Like, this is fucking great. It was really good. Really? Yeah. No, I think the most exotic thing I ever ate, and it wasn't. It was kind of a similar. I'm eating what they're serving situation is on this ranch outside of Stanford, Texas, and they, they we barbecued up a bunch of armadillo. How was that? I was so freaking hungry. It's, it seemed good to me. I, you know, this is well before I knew they had leprosy. <laughs> <laughs> but I checked everything. I'm good. I'm 40 years in, and I'm fine. Is there a temperature you have to kill, kill leprosy at where you cook the food to, like trichinosis? I, well, look, when you smoke, the, you smoke it for like 12 hours, so I think anything just dead. kills everything. Yeah. What is this? What does armadillo taste like? It kind of tastes like pork. Really? Yeah. Like javelina, then. Yeah. Yeah, which just tastes a lot. Well, they even look like pork. Yeah. Well, yeah. they are pork. They're a peccary. Yeah. Right. It's like yeah, a yeah. Cousin of pig. Yeah. Some somewhere, and yeah. they've crossbred, I think, with the feral hogs a bunch. Oh, have they I really? Think, I think. Um, I shot one last year, and I turned it into chorizo. It's edible. Yeah. It's not great. Yeah. But it's the edible. feral hog. I'm not. You don't want to eat those. Feral I've hogs. eaten a lot of feral hogs. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I shot hey, one at Tejon, turned it into sausage. Did you? It's good. Yeah. Those things are a problem. I mean, they are- They're a real problem out here. Oh, my gosh. And and the destruction that they that they reap on the on the ecosystem. I mean, that's the reason the bobwhite quail population has just plummeted. Mm-hmm. Rattlesnakes have stopped rattling. Because of the hogs? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, one of the first things that happened when I moved out here is Ted Nugent invited me to shoot hogs from a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I guess I'm in Texas. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Come shoot hogs out of a helicopter. They're just gunning them down. 